Hi and welcome to this lecture on integumentary structures or accessory organs of the skin. The first thing to keep in mind is that each of these accessory organs, the nails, hair, and the exocrine glands, are derived from epidermal epithelium. That means that the epithelial has given rise to those later on in development. These are known as epidermal derivatives and they are formed from portions of the epidermis that is invaginated into the derma. So if you think of taking something like a finger and punching it down into your skin, you will form an invagination into the skin. And then things like a hair can come out or we can look at something like a nail itself on the end of a finger. So each of these has arise from the epidermis itself. The first thing that we want to look at is nail structure. The structure of nails are a modification of the stratum corneum which is the uppermost level of the epidermis. We will find them on the dorsal edges of the fingers and toes. They are there for protection and to assist in grasping objects. As you look at the structure of nails, you're going to see each of these structures. And just to briefly show you what's in the bold, we will have a, a figure coming up shortly. You are looking at the free edge, the nail body, and the nail root, which these three together constitute the nail plate. Then you have the nail bed, and then the nail matrix. In addition, you have the lunula, the nail folds, the cuticle, or the technical term eponychium, and the hyponychium. Here's a figure showing the fingernail structure, the free edge, the nail body, which is directly underneath the nail itself, the nail fold, which is that fold of skin around the nail, you see the groove, the lunule, which is that whitish portion of the nail, and the cuticle, which is right here. Now looking at a longitudinal section of a finger, you can see the three components of the nail plate being the free edge, the nail body, and the cuticle as described up here. Here is the nail root which is back underneath the cuticle itself. And the nail fold which is that piece of skin over top of the nail root. And in the nail root you have the nail matrix. This is the area of actively dividing cells that give rise to the nail itself. The second thing that I would like to look at is hair. Now hair is found almost everywhere on the body except for a couple places. The hands and the palms of the fingers or the palmar surface of the fingers, the sides and soles of the feet and toes, the lips, and portions of the external genitalia. The composition of hair which is termed a pillus is simply a slender filament of keratinized cells growing from hair follicles. Now there are three types of hair and they are lanugo, vellus, and terminal hair. Lanugo is that fine unpigmented hair that you see on newborns that appears in the last trimester of pregnancy. Vellus is a fine hair that you find on the upper and lower limbs mainly of females or children and then you have terminal hair which is the coarser pigmented longer hair that you see in the scalp eyebrows and eyelashes including men's beards and during puberty this is the hair that replaces vellus in the axillary and pubic regions here's a figure showing you the structure or structures that we have associated with hair. The first is the hair matrix. It is a structure at the base of the hair bulb. This is the place that we have epithelial cells dividing. 
and as it produces new cells they are gradually pushed upward toward the cell surface. Next we have the medulla here. The medulla is the remnant of the matrix and it contains flexible soft keratin as well. Let's take a look at the three zones along the length of the hair. You have the hair bulb, as I mentioned earlier. It surrounds the hair papilla, which is composed of connective tissue itself. You can also see it is vascularized as well with arteries and veins. The root, which is the portion of the hair that is deep to the skin surface and it is both root and bulb consisting of dead epithelial tissue. So the root goes from here to there. And finally we have the shaft and the shaft is that portion of the hair that extends beyond the skin surface that's what we normally see and it is the only region containing living epithelial cells. Now let's continue with the hair components, the cortex and the cuticle. The cortex is the flattened cells outside of the medulla that are relatively hard. Then you have the cuticle which is this lining of tissue here. It is a single layer surrounding the cortex itself. Finally let's look at the hair follicle and the erector pili muscle. Now the hair follicle, so we have the connective tissue root sheath and the epithelial tissue root sheath that help comprise the hair follicle itself. Finally we have the erector pili muscle. It is a smooth muscle that extends from a dermal papilla, which is one of these structures, to the hair follicle itself and it elevates the hair with contraction. So the, hair, the muscle will pull this, this direction and as it does the hair becomes elevated and that is what produces goosebumps on human skin. Let's take a look at the functions of hair. We have protection. It protects the scalp from sunburn and injury. It can also trap particles or foreign matter in the nostrils and ears. The eyelashes help keep particles out of the eyes and the eyebrows help keep sweat out of the eyes as well. It can also function in heat retention which prevents the loss of heat from the scalp to the air around it. In addition we have sensory reception that allows us to do things like touch and feel that is called tactile receptors. Visual identification that is social in determining age, sex, or specific individuals, and also chemical signal dispersal in the form of pheromones. These are chemical signals involved in attracting sexual partners, and they are secreted by specific sweat glands into the hairs and axillary and pubic regions. Now, with hair growth, you can also get loss and replacement. We have diffuse hair loss, which is hair shed from all parts of the scalp that is common primarily in women. We also have male pattern baldness, which is the loss of hair from only some regions of the scalp. It is a combination of genetic and hormonal factors. The baldness allele, or that part of the DNA, is dominant in males and recessive in females, which is why you don't see it as much in females as you do males and it is expressed only in the presence of high testosterone so even if a female has it if the testosterone level isn't high enough it isn't expressed finally I want to look at the exocrine glands of the skin there are many types of exocrine glands that you can find in the skin the two most common are the sweat and sebaceous glands there are a couple different kinds of, of sweat glands that I'll talk about as well there are two groups 
of sweat glands. You have the merocrine and apocrine. You may also see this called the eccrine sweat glands. There is a general structure. They are coiled tubes that secrete in the reticular dermis. They have a gland duct that carries these secretions to where they are being delivered. In the case of sweat, that is in a sweat pore on the epidermal surface. And it also contains myoepithelial cells. Myo meaning muscle and epithelial meaning epithelium. So these are muscle cells that will contract to squeeze the gland to force the sweat out and discharge those, those secretions in response to sympathetic stimulation. Here is a figure showing some of the glands. Here's the apocrine gland, which is another kind of sweat gland. Here is the merocrine, as I was just talking about. You can see the secretory cells and the myoepithelial cells, and then the lumen, which is the open space that it will deliver its secretions through. That's the lumen. Finally, we will also look at the sebaceous gland coming up, and you can see the gland itself here and the hair follicle here, which is what sebaceous glands are associated with. The American sweat glands are the most numerous of the sweat glands. You find them everywhere over the body. They are discharging sweat onto the skin surface. It is composed mainly of water and just a little bit of other chemicals, including electrolytes, metabolites, which are those byproducts of metabolism, and waste products. Sweat glands function mainly in thermoregulation or to control temperature within the body. They do so by fluid evaporation. However, as you sweat, you also lose water and electrolytes as well. The secretions are diluting harmful chemicals. They also help in antibacterial activity. You get rid of these secretions by exocytosis. The second kind of gland is the apocrine sweat gland. They don't discharge their secretions onto the skin surface. They are into hair follicles themselves. They are found in the axillae around nipples and in the pubic and anal region. They don't produce sweat. They produce a version of sweat that is viscous, thicker secretion that contains mainly proteins and lipids. You typically see this during puberty. It produces an odor when acted on by bacteria, which is why most young children don't smell as bad as those after puberty from things such as sweating. Finally, we have the sebaceous glands. It produces an oily secretion called sebum. The sebum is beneficial to both skin and hair. It has bactericidal properties. It helps reduce bacteria and it is discharged into the hair follicle itself. Now they are a type of holocrine gland which means the oil is produced within a cell and then the cell will lyse releasing the oil into the ducts which is carried to the hair follicles themselves. It is not produced by exocytosis. The secretion is stimulated by hormones especially androgens and activated during puberty. The androgens, things such as testosterone and estrogen. Two other glands that I would like to mention is the ceraminous glands. These are modified apocrine sweat glands. They produce ceramin, what we call earwax, that functions into help trapping foreign material and it does lubricate the acoustic meatus and the eardrum within the ear itself. The last one is the mammary glands. These are modified apocrine sweat glands as well, found in breast tissue. Only function in pregnant and lactating females that produce the milk for the nursing infant.